Okay, <clears throat> so are we ready? All right. Sounds good. Go ahead. <laughs> well, welcome back, folks. We're deep into Ozarks history, and we've been talking the last couple of weeks about the Native American culture that uh, was present here in the Ozarks. The first week we talked about the Bluff Dwellers, which were kind of an archaic prehistoric type tribe. And then last week we talked about the Mound Builders, which kind of surrounded the Ozarks and particularly uh, the great culture of the Cahokians, which uh, built this huge mound on the east side of the Mississippi River across from St. Louis. So today we're going to talk about that group of Indians that was present in the Ozarks when the Anglos, the Spanish, the French, and then the Americans finally arrived into the Ozarks. And that group of Indians are the Osage. Uh, we don't really hear that much about the Osage. They're kind of one of those tribes that a lot of people don't know much about, but they are an absolutely fascinating tribe of Indians. So as always, one of the first things I do is spotlight a famous Ozarker. Uh, now this guy actually moved into the Ozarks as a very young child and spent the rest of his adult life in and out of the Ozarks. Uh, some of you may recognize him. Uh, probably more so if I do this. That is pretty boy Floyd, Charles Arthur Floyd. By the way, uh, he detested the nickname pretty boy. He actually preferred the name chalk because he was part Choctaw Indian. And so he much preferred that nickname besides Pretty Boy. But uh, that's my famous Ozarker of the day. He was born and raised in uh, Salislaw, uh, Oklahoma, right across the border in the Cookson Hills of Oklahoma, which are definitely part of the Ozarks. Uh, so what can we say about the Osage? Well, that was the tribe of Native Americans that was present uh, when, as I said, when Anglos first came in to the Ozarks. Uh, we don't know for sure where they came from. The general consensus is they probably originated in the Ohio River Valley somewhere and probably moved westward uh, somewhere around 1500 AD or so when the powerful Iroquois nation from the east began to move west and, and absorb that land. And so the Osage probably came here probably not that far removed from when the first Anglos came here. They settled along the Osage River, uh, which is uh, up on kind of the northwest boundary of the Ozarks, flows into the Missouri River, uh, where Lake of the Ozarks is now. And uh, we do know that in 1680, when the French began to explore this area in quite a bit of detail, they... Uh, end up saying there was at least 18 major villages along the river. So they were a pretty, pretty substantial tribe. Um, they were kind of connected uh, in with the Sioux. Uh, they spoke the same language as the Sioux. They had many of the same uh, religious uh, rituals as the Sioux. They also were related to the Omaha and the Ponca tribes, which settled in Nebraska, and the Kanza tribe, which settled in Kansas and the Quapaw tribe, which basically settled in Arkansas. And they kind of have an alliance with these, <clears throat> these five tribes kind of had an alliance where uh, they kind of ruled this area. So sometime prior to the arrival of the French, the Osage had split into two different tribes. Uh, one of them was called the Big Osage and they settled along the Osage River. And the other one was the Little Osage along the Marad de Singe River. I hope I pronounced that right. I tried to figure out how to pronounce it. We got on there today, just south of the Missouri tribe, uh, which of course gave the name to the state. So they're kind of split into two tribes, but they, they worked together. They weren't enemies or anything like that. Now, the Osage had a legend about where they came from. They said that they uh, came from grandfather son in the sky, and they felt like they had fell to earth into three groups. First of all, they said the people of the water had fell to earth first, and then the people of the land fell after them, and finally, the people of the sky. And the earth and the sky people then divided into these two clans, 
becoming known as Nau Kansha, which translated means children of the middle waters, which the French translated as Osage. And so that's how the name came to be. That was their legend. This kind of shows you a map. The Osage would have definitely been in control of what we call the Ozarks, the Quapaw down here in the southeastern part of uh, Missouri and also northern Arkansas. The Illini tribe up along the Mississippi River boundary and then the Missouri tribe, which is where, of course, the state got its name. So what were the Osage? Well, they were hunters and uh, gatherers, just like they grew crops, they were farmers. Uh, they definitely were, you know, true hunters. Uh, they would plant crops, and they did this in the spring, corn, beans, pumpkin, squash, typical Indian crops. And then they would take off for the summer, the men would. And they would spend the whole summer out on the plains uh, doing buffalo hunts. Uh, it often led them into conflict with the Kiowa and the Apache. And these were the two tribes that they absolutely despised. And the Kiowa and Apache and the Osage were dreaded enemies. Uh, while they were gone, the women would tend to the crops. They harvested them in the early fall. And when all the work was done, the warriors would return. Uh, men had it pretty good in the uh, Osage tribe. The women stayed around the camp <clears throat> and the uh, village and they did all the work with the, with the garden and the men went out hunting and playing around. Once the crops were harvested and stored uh, and the game from the summer hunt was dried, then they had another hunt, a fall hunt. Now this usually took them into the interior of the Ozarks. The fall hunt was not so much out on the plains as much as down into the Ozarks. And they would hunt beaver and deer and things that were prevalent in the interior of the Ozarks. So that was basically the life of the Osage. Um, pretty good life, to say the least. Uh, this is a, an early photograph of some Osage women. They'll give you some idea of what they look like. And uh, they all dressed pretty much the same. They all parted their hair in the middle like that. By the way, for some reason, they always put red dye along the crease of their hair, uh, they, would, they would do this. And they always dress pretty modestly as such. Now, the villages of the Osage were extremely intricate and it was very complex and they always were laid out exactly the same way. And this had to do because of their religion. Remember, they felt like they had fallen to earth uh, in the two clans. And so every village was laid upon an east-west axis. One part of the village lay to the north. This was the Chaiso, the people of the air clan. And they represented the peace. They represented, they were, they were not so much warriors. The southern clan on the other side of the thoroughfare that ran on this east-west axis were the Hunka tribe. And they were the people of the earth. This was the warriors. And they definitely were much more warlike than were the, the Tijo clan. Uh, between the two uh, lodges, uh, between the two clans on this thoroughfare was the lodge of the two chiefs. There was only two chiefs in each clan, in each tribe. And uh, the chiefs would have their lodges side by side. Uh, the, their lodgings were always almost exactly alike. Uh, they were kind of a frame pole lodge covered with reeds or thatch or sometimes buffalo hides or whatever. And um, they always faced eastward because they wanted to be able to welcome the morning sun. Remember, they felt like they were descendants of the great son, of, of, of grandfather's son. And so they fixed their villages so their doors always faced eastward toward the morning sun. Uh, outside of the village was a mystery lodge, which was kind of like a, I guess for lack of a better term, a church. Uh, it's where the males would come in and they would sit and they would worship and relax. It was kind of a combination church, social club. Um, it's where they'd smoke their pipe, where they would tell stories, uh, where they would do their 
religious rituals. Of course, women were not included. They were always excluded from all this. This is a photograph of a very early Osage dwelling. Um, as you can see, it's pretty substantial. And they always had a, a hole up here roof for the fire to escape. And this would have been facing the east towards the sun. Now, the Osage were a very physically imposing looking group of people. Um, one of the reasons was because they practice a form of eugenics. Uh, what that basically means is that if an infant was born deformed, uh, weak, sickly looking, they would let it die. Uh, only the strong survived amongst the Osage. And um, if, if they had an infant that was not strong or had a deformity of any kind, uh, they just would take it out and let nature take its course. Uh, we have several descriptions of the Osage. George Catlin, who came west and painted a lot of paintings of the tribes, he said they were the tallest race of men in North America, with many of them six and a half to seven feet tall. And a Scottish missionary, a man by the name of Isaac McCoy, said they were the finest looking Indians he had ever seen in the West. There's no doubt about the fact that the Osage were an imposing looking group of people. They were very tall. They were very lean. Their warriors were, which was kind of an abnormality. Uh, most Native Americans look, you can't see me, but I'm about five, 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 six, and kind of squat. Uh, that's how most Native Americans look. They were short and kind of squat and kind of bow legged. They were not imposing looking people. They were great warriors, but they weren't really physically imposing people. The Osage, uh, they were almost uh, really one of the, I mean, as they said, one of the finest looking groups of Indians that there were, and not just Indians, but men. Men were very proud of their body. Uh, during the warm one, uh, months of the year, they only wore breech cloth and leggings. Uh, Sometimes they just went totally naked. They tattooed their bodies in brilliant colors. They always had tattoos. They absolutely abhorred body hair. They, they thought hair was horrible. And they would shave their bodies. They would pluck out their eyebrows. The only thing they had was a scalp lock. And I'll show you a picture of an of a Osage warrior here in a minute. And that the only thing they had was just a little bit of hair up here on the top of their head. Other than that, they would remove all their body hair because they absolutely abhorred it. They thought it was terrible. They were also extremely clean. They bathed every day. They always built their camps along a stream or a river. And after they got up and said their morning prayers, they would immediately go into the river and wash. Uh, they just felt like that was, you know, that was the thing to do. Uh, women, on the other hand, not so much. They'd let their hair grow long. They covered their bodies with the robe of deer skin. They weren't nearly, um, you know, the women were obviously second class citizens. This is an early photograph. That's a painting uh, by George Catlin of a uh, uh, Osage where you can see tall and lean. Uh, they were not short and squat by any means. That is an actual photograph that was taken of an Osage warrior. And you can see that, again, they don't fit the typical concept of what we think of a Native American. Um, they were much taller than lean. They were very good looking young a race of people. Um, they just, they really, uh, you know, were imposing as such. Now, they were extremely religious. Uh, the Osage were very, very spiritual people. Uh, they were also very superstitious people. They believed, as I said, that everything came from Wakanta, grandfather, son. Uh, and they thought everything had a spirit. They thought everything on earth had part of Wakanta in it. So they worshiped nature. They believed that anyone who had lived his life in harmony with Wakanta would upon death join him in the sky. And they thought if you had transgressed, if you had... Uh, not lived your life right, that you would suffer punishment uh, in the form of sickness, natural disaster. So if something happened bad to the Osage, they always felt like it was because somebody had done something wrong. 
Um, they further believed that warriors who died during war were uh, special. They were given a special place with walk and talk. So if you died in war, fighting your enemy, then you were you were thought to have just gone straight up to walk and talk and joined him. Uh, one of the biggest things about the Osage and everybody that saw them wrote about this. Every morning they would arise before the dawn and prepare themselves for the rising sun. And they would engage in what was called a dawn chant. Uh, as the sun would rise up over the horizon, they would be chanting and singing a song, welcoming grandfather sun. Uh, one of the most important festivals was something called the green corn dance. Uh, and this was a harvest festival they would have in the fall. Now, they were spiritual, but they were also highly superstitious. And they, they felt like, you know, if something they could not figure out uh, happened, it would scare them. For instance, and this is, uh, this is one of the important things the white man figured out real fast. For whatever reason, the Osage apparently could not whistle. Uh, you know, some people don't have the ability to whistle. I'm one of those people. I cannot whistle. Uh, it's just, it's something I've, you know, the way my tongue is made and the way my mouth is made, I cannot whistle. And they apparently, this was a genetic thing that was a most uh, inherent in every Osage. And they were absolutely scared to death of anyone that could whistle. And the white man learned this really rapidly. And even though the Osage were great warriors, the white man figured out that if they come riding into their village whistling, that these big, gigantic warriors that were extremely fierce would be, you know, hiding in their in their shelters under a mat or something because they were absolutely petrified of people that could whistle. And the white man learned this very rapidly and got a lot of dominance over the Osage because of it. I know it sounds silly, but they were extremely superstitious. They were absolutely frightened to death of lightning because they felt like this was Wakanta sending out arrows to them. And uh, they, would, again, would hide in their shelters. They would shake. Uh, they would absolutely not have anything to do with a storm. If they found a piece of wood that was struck by it, they would not use it uh, because they felt like it was, it, it was evil. This was passed down to many white men. And I can clearly remember uh, my grandpa talking about this, how you never used wood that was struck by lightning because it was, uh, it was bad wood, wouldn't work right. I didn't know it. I didn't figure it out until much later what he was talking about. Now, I've got a couple of uh, things here about the Don chant. I thought I would read this to you. One of his description of it by Elmo Ingenthron. Elmo Ingenthron was a local historian that wrote a book called The Indians of the Ozark Plateau. And he talked about the Osage Dawn Chant. And then I've got a quote here by a man by the name of John Matthews, who actually was an Osage and was raised in an Osage village. So let me read these two things to you. I think it really sums up their religion. Wherever the Osage pitched their camps, the coming dawn brought this strange, emotion-packed religious phenomena. In preparation for the, for the ritual, they sometimes anointed their faces with mud. Their prayers began in the highest sing-song note obtainable and continued as long as there was breath and in progressively lower tones to the lowest keys. So it would start real high and go low. This was repeated over and over again until they were wrought to a pitch. It was a very emotional thing. Others have chanted the hunter's song or maybe sought Wakanta's favors for some upcoming horse stealing expedition. Some lay prostrate upon the ground, exhausted, crying and sobbing as if their hearts were broke, supplementing the chants of the Indians were the howling and barking of a multitude of dogs which were always present in and about the villages. And this is from John Matthews. He actually participated with this as a knit Osage, and later on he wrote a book about the Osage. Um, he said that he had heard it many times as I grew up, and I've never been able to describe it to myself. It was indescribable, and there's nothing with which it could compare. It filled my soul with fear and bitter sweetness, an exotic yearning, 
And when it had ended, I lay there in my exultant fear trance. I hoped there would be more of it and yet afraid there might be. It seemed to me later after I had begun to reason that this prayer, this chant, this soul-stirring petition always ended before it was finished. It was a sob of frustration. It was Neolithic man talking to God. It must have been a really uh, fantastic thing to have witnessed, to seen this dawn chant go on. Uh, here's a painting, I think this is by Catlin, of the Green Corn Dance, which was their harvest dance. Now, as I mentioned, the Osage were fierce warriors. And, uh, you know, again, we don't, when we think about fierce Indians that were warriors, we think of the Sioux, we think of the Apache, the Comanche, we think of the Great Plains tribe, these Greek horsemen. We don't think of the Osage, and yet, folks, the Osage was one of the most fearsome tribes and no other Indian tribe really wanted to go up against them again, because they were so big to begin with. Uh, they did not have the attitude of forgiveness. They absolutely did not forgive. Uh, they practiced the old Testament philosophy of an eye for an eye. Uh, when they acquired the horse and the firearms, they were a most, among the most warlike Indian tribes routinely engaged in battle with Indian tribes, particularly, as I mentioned, the Kiowa and Apache. Fortunately for the white settlers, there was very little interaction between the white settlers and the Osage that was bad. Uh, the Osage, uh, for whatever reason, they, they tended to uh, fear the white man more than some tribe did. Maybe it was this ability that the white man had to whistle. I don't know. Um, like most Plains tribes, the Osage counted coup. That was much more important than killing your enemy. Counting coup meant that, uh, you know, you basically was able to steal a horse or steal a woman or steal a child or steal a horse or touch the horse, uh, touch another warrior in combat. That was much more important than killing your enemy. One of the major contributions to this warlike attitude was the fact that they established many trails across the Ozarks. And these trails later on became what we now call some of the major thoroughfares or highways across the Ozarks. Uh, when the white man first came into the Ozarks, there were already established Indian trails and they just built upon these. For instance, the Osage Trace ran primarily from what we would call St. Louis to Springfield. And uh, later on, of course, that became Route 66. And later on, that became now present I-44. So when you come down I-44 from St. Louis to Springfield, you're traveling along what was originally an Osage Warriors Trail. And then there was an Osage, something they called the Osage Warriors Trail that ran south of Kansas City along the Osage River Valley south into Arkansas, basically present day I-49. If you travel south on I-49 in Arkansas, you're basically traveling along the Osage Warriors Trail. And then there was a trail that ran east and west in the southern part of the Ozarks, basically again from Springfield, Greene County, the Prairie, all the way over in the southeastern part of Missouri. That was called the Virginia Warriors Trail. And that is present day Route 60. So these trails, that these major thoroughfares that kind of cross the Ozarks today were already tra trails long before Anglos ever came in. By the way, they would mark these trails. Uh, they knew how to mark them. And what they would do, they would take a sapling and they would tie the sapling, they would tie it around the top of the sapling and stake it to the ground. And that would produce a tree that would be growing up and then that way and then that way. Uh, I'll show you a picture of a thong tree in a minute. That's what they call them, thong trees. By the way, I taught high school for many, many years and uh, I taught Ozarks history. You can imagine the snickers I got when I talked about thong trees. I was always guaranteed the kids would start snickering uh, when I talked about thong trees. You know. uh, this is a map of some of the Warriors Trails. This is the old Osage Trace, and this is the Virginia Warriors Trail here. 
Uh, this is the Osage Warriors Trail. Uh, just a major trail. They follow basically highways today. Uh, if you were to travel along these roads, they're basically um, old Indian trails. This is a picture of an actual thong tree. Uh, and you can see they would take it and they would bend it over and stick it to the ground and then the tree would grow up like this. You've probably seen these and didn't even know what you were seeing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in my short lifetime, as young as I am, I can remember thong trees. There was one just a couple of blocks from where I'm sitting right now on Golden Avenue. And, uh, you know, I used to cross, I used to pass it all the time. And I'd tell my wife, I said, boy, look at that old Indian thong tree. And I'll never forget the day I passed by and they'd cut it down. And I was just heartbroken. Of course, they didn't know what they were doing. And they, you know, it was sitting in somebody's front yard and they probably thought it was the ugliest tree they'd ever seen, but it was an Indian marker. Uh, and by the way, that it marked where the Trail of Tears later on was uh, taken through. So just one of those things, unfortunately. Now, <clears throat> the Osage, unfortunately, uh, couldn't stay around the Ozarks because as the white man came into the Ozarks, uh, you know, that was something that didn't work. White men and Indians did not get along very well. And so there began to be a movement to force the Osage out of their traditional home of the Ozarks. Uh, finally, uh, they signed a treaty called the Treaty of Fort Osage uh, in 1808, where they basically ceded all their lands between the Missouri and the Arkansas River to the United States, and they moved into Kansas. The problem is they really didn't move. Yeah, they moved their camps, but they kept coming back into the Ozarks for their hunts. And so during the 1820s and 1830s, uh, when the white man was basically first moving into the Ozarks, uh, there was conflict with the Osage, much more so between the Osage and other Indian tribes, because as you're going to see in a minute, uh, one of the things that the white man did was use the Osage, or pardon me, the Ozarks as a dumping ground for other Indian tribes. Uh, eventually, they did basically give up their hunting grounds. And, uh, you know, even though they kept coming around, they finally ended up giving it up. By 1870, the Osage uh, were being forced out of Kansas, and they sold their Kansas lands to the government. And then they took the money, and they went into Oklahoma, uh, right across the border in the northeast Oklahoma, and they bought land. This is the only Indian tribe that did this. All the other Indian tribes were given the land by the government. The Osage ended up buying their land. That proved to be a very wise move because what happened was in the late 19th, early 20th century, this was the area where all the oil originally was found in Oklahoma and the Osage became the wealthiest tribe in America. They were absolutely unbelievably wealthy. Uh, this is the area where the Osage uh, were found. Uh, Pawhuska, Ponca City, Bartlesville, all this area right here was where the Osage Nation uh, was. And they owned their land. And as a result, they owned the oil. And so they were able to, to you know, reap tons of wealth. Folks, I, I don't think we can appreciate how much money they made. In 1923, uh, they got enough money out of the oil wells on their land that it amounted to over $400 million in current dollars. The tribe was only like two or 3,000 people. Can you imagine the wealth that these people had? Unfortunately, that led to a really serious incident known as the Osage Indian murders. One of those uh, stories that has gotten lost you're probably going to hear about it more in the next few months because there's a big movie getting ready to come out about this. Uh, like I said, in 1897, oil was discovered in the Osage Union Reservation. And by 1920, the market for oil had grown dramatically and brought much wealth to the Osage, estimated to be somewhere around $400 million just in that one year alone. 
The oil broom bought wealth to the old sage. It also bought a criminal element. People begin to figure out, hey, let's somehow uh, get this money. Uh, that began what was known as a reign of terror in Osage County in the 1920s. And what would happen would be that, that white men would go in and marry an Osage woman. And then all of a sudden her family would begin to die off. And, you know, maybe they were poisoned, maybe they were shot, maybe their house was blown up. All of these things happened. Uh, we know at least 40. Uh, most people assume it was in the hundreds of people that died in this reign of terror. Uh, it, was a, it was a criminal effort to absorb all this wealth. It got so bad, and the local authorities were so incompetent that they finally called in an organization of the federal government called the Bureau of Investigation, which ultimately became the FBI. This was the FBI's first case. This was what put them on the map. They eventually uh, arrested several people, including a man by the name of William Hale. Uh, they were convicted of the murders and subsequently imprisoned in Fort Leavenworth, and it kind of stopped. It also led to uh, the Osage, the Congress passing a law saying basically that you had to have so much Osage blood in you, ancestry, in order to be able to inherit this oil, what they call uh, uh, head rights. Uh, just recently, a man wrote a book called Killers of the Flower Moon, the Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI. And that's going to be a movie here pretty shortly with Leone and Caprio and some other big names. It's going to be, it's a, supposedly going to be a really, uh, you know, big selling movie. Uh, but I could recommend this book if you've, uh, it's really easy to read and it's really interesting. If you get a chance, you might read it called Killers of the Flower Moon by David Gran. Uh, very good book. I've got a really short little video here that I thought you might, uh, enjoy looking at it. And it talks, it's a little video about the reign of terror in the Osage. So let's watch this. In the late 1800s, the Native American Osage tribe who primarily resided in Midwestern territories such as Oklahoma, struck oil and became one of the wealthiest communities in Oklahoma throughout the early 20th century. The Osage tribe flourished and gained access to innovative automobiles and quality clothing, luxuries typically only afforded to rich white Americans. For example, in 1923, the tribe earned $30 million in oil revenue, a figure that equates to well over $400 million today. After the American Civil War, the United States government took a vested interest in improving the lives of Native Americans through various allotment and reconstruction programs and laws. Under the federal government's Osage Allotment Act of 1906, the Osage tribe reserved the right to any wealth gained through the minerals found on their reservation, including oil. However, the act's head rights system dictated that any relative or heir of an Osage individual could become a recipient of that individual's wealth upon his or her death, regardless of if that recipient was of Osage blood or not. Additionally, the act required that the Osage were assigned white overseers to manage the administration of the tribe's oil boom wealth. While the government believed that the Osage Allotment Act would protect the Osage tribe's newfound wealth, in actuality, the act merely encouraged fiscal abuse of the Osage by whites through the overseer and head right inheritance systems. Racism, greed, and tragedy plagued Osage history throughout the early 1920s, as the tribe's new overseers purposefully mismanaged, extorted, and stole money from the tribe in order to enrich themselves. Additionally, several white relatives of tribesmen engaged in questionable behavior in order to secure an oil inheritance. One particularly gruesome circumstance saw William Hale, the uncle of a white man who married an Osage woman, Molly Burkhart, 
systematically murder his niece-in-law's blood relatives to ensure he and his nephew would receive larger shares of Osage oil money. While the exact number remains unknown, potentially hundreds of Osage people were murdered from 1921 to 1925 in what came to be known as the Reign of Terror. When local and state authorities failed the tribe, the Osage requested the federal government investigate these heinous acts. The murders and disappearances of Osage people drew the attention of the fledgling FBI, whose undercover agents quickly discovered William Hale was behind the murders of Molly Burkhardt's relatives. New federal legislation in 1925 prohibited those who were not Osage from inheriting head rights, which resulted in a dramatic decrease in white corruption and interference in Osage economic affairs. It is important to remember that even though the racism and greed of others harmed the Osage tribe during the early 1920s, the Osage were not helpless. While the Osage endured the greed of vindictive white men, they have carefully worked alongside the Bureau of Indian Affairs since the reign of terror occurred, ensuring the Osage head rights remain within the tribe, and that events similar to the Reign of Terror never occur again. Through the careful legal breakdown of the Osage Allotment Act, the tribe has regained control over much of their wealth and economic interests. Most recently, in the late 1990s, the Osage tribe successfully sued the United States government for over $300 million for its support of the mismanagement of native wealth through the Osage Allotment Act of 1906. Okay, I thought you'd really enjoy that. Now, <clears throat> as well as the Osage, when the Osage were being pushed out of the Ozarks, this occurred around the first part of the 19th century. Remember, that's the period of time we gained the Ozarks, the United States did, along with all the other areas of the Louisiana Territory. And so Thomas Jefferson and so the other people looked at the Ozarks and thought this was a perfect solution to the Indian problem back east because they wanted to take the Indian tribes in the eastern part of the United States and push them west. And they saw the Ozarks as a perfect dumping ground. They thought, hey, nobody's gonna wanna live there. It's rugged, it's remote. Uh, nobody really you know, is gonna want this land. So let's move all these Indian tribes in the east out to the Ozarks. And so the Ozarks became the first place where the United States government began to force Indians west. Eventually, uh, as the Ozarks grew, then they forced them into Oklahoma, and that became known as the Indian Nation. The only problem was uh, two things. Number one, they really didn't understand how fast the Ozarks was going to grow. Uh, they didn't understand the desire, particularly the Scots-Irish, to settle in the Ozarks because they to them, that was great land, and it reminded them of Ireland. It, it was remote, which is exactly what they were looking for. They also didn't come to grips with what the Osage would do, because the Osage, even though they had sold their land, they still continued to hunt in it, and this ended up creating all sorts of problems. So for the next 30 to 40 years, from about 1810 to about 1840 or so, uh, you saw a lot of eastern tribes that were forcefully moved into the Ozarks until they were eventually moved into Oklahoma. And the result was that there was quite a bit of turmoil in the Ozarks in the 1820s and 30s. Uh, this will give you a map here, kind of show you uh, some of the tribes. There were the Shawnee Delaware tribes, uh, which came from the East Coast. And they were in these principal areas. There was Peoria tribe from Illinois. There was the Piankasha also from Illinois. Uh, there was the Kickapoo tribe from Ohio and Indiana. And so these tribes were forcefully moved into the Ozarks. And this became kind of the original Indian nation for about 20 or 30 years until they were eventually moved into what we now call Oklahoma. So let's look real briefly and real rapidly a couple of these tribes. Following the War of 1812, the Kickapoo tribe, which was located in Illinois and Indiana, became one of the first tribes to be moved into the Ozarks. 
Uh, and they settled primarily along the White River uh, and also south of the Osage River. Uh, and even though, again, the Osage had sold this land, uh, they still continued to use it as a hunting ground. The result was there was a lot of open warfare between the Osage and the Kickapoo. Now, originally, the white man thought, hey, we'll just let them fight it out, you know. But that didn't work out so well because the white men were moving into this area and they thought they had to get it under control. So eventually the army came in and kind of put, you know, all this fighting uh, down. By the way, uh, one of the sites of the Kickapoo tribe was about four or five miles from where I'm sitting and is the present day site of a, of a Springfield High School by the name of Kickapoo. And that's where they get their name. They the uh, high school was named after the Indian tribe, uh, of which their grounds of the, uh, uh, you know, high school is built. There's a, uh, one of these Springfield University Club markers that was set up in 1925, said from approximately 1812 to 1832, a Kickapoo Indian village occupied the site founded in the north by Madison, west by Camel, south by Grand, and east by Jefferson. 100 wigwams clustered around the spring, formerly situated 250 feet southwest of this point. The Indians are believed to have planted on this site the first orchard of the Indian peach. Um, and so today that's where Kickapoo High School sits, is on this land. Uh, this is a photograph of one of the Kickapoo Indians. Looks a lot like the Osage in some ways. Uh, there was also the Shawnee and the, and the Delaware tribe. There were many of these also. And uh, they were brought west and settled around originally the Merrimack and the current rivers to the eastern part of the Ozarks. But finally, they were moved into the James River area, right south of Springfield. They had a huge village uh, where Wilson's Creek and James River meet. And that became known as Delaware Town. And uh, there's currently a conservation access there. Uh, remember the Shawnee uh, were really a very powerful tribe. Uh, one of the reasons they got moved was because their chief back east, Tecumseh, tried to unify all the Indian tribes and fight the white man. And they end up uh, being defeated and end up getting moved into the Ozarks. Uh, there was also some lesser tribes, the Wees, the Miami, uh, the Peoria, the Pianca Shaws. Uh, these were all moved into the Ozarks as well. Uh, this is a photograph of the old Delaware town uh, excess at the James River, still there, still used. Uh, there's a big archaeological site going on by Missouri State University there. One last thing, I want to tell you a story. Uh, I'm full of stories, okay? This is a photograph of a woman by the name of Indian Annie. Now, if you're from the Ozarks and you're from the Springfield area, you may have heard of the legend of Indian, Indian Annie. Uh, it's not really a legend. It's a true story. Uh, when the Delaware were beginning to be moved out in Oklahoma, for whatever reason, some of them decided they were going to leave this little infant girl. Uh, I don't know what the reason was, but they left her at a spring house of a neighboring farmer, a man by the name of Young. And this is the Young family. And uh, this is... a. Uh, a picture of them on their land, which was not far from Delaware town. Uh, I'm very familiar with the Youngs because my grandmother's sister is in this picture. And she was one of the Youngs that, that uh, I'm gonna be talking about here in a minute. The Delaware tribe left this little girl named, and they, the Youngs took her into their family and she was raised up in their family. She eventually married an ex-slave, which the family owned, and uh, they lived in a log cabin right next to their house for many, many years. My dad remembered Indian Annie. He told me about her and told her, told me all about the story about how they found her at the spring house and raised her up as one of their own. Uh, and she moved into this log cabin. That log cabin uh, I've been by it several times until the last couple of years when it finally fell apart. Uh, again, I'm sure the people there have no idea what this cabin was all about, but uh, it's the story of Indian Annie. And uh, 
you know, a lot of people know this story. If you live around Christian Green County, they've heard the story. Okay, next week, we're going to finish up talking about the Native Americans. And we're going to talk about the Cherokee. The Cherokee is the most well-known tribe in the Ozarks. Uh, it has, you know, more stories about Cherokee. More people uh, are related to the Cherokee because many of the Cherokee dropped off the Trail of Tears and stayed in the Ozarks including part of my family, as you'll see next week. So next week, the Cherokee. I hope you've enjoyed this. And, uh, you know, if you get a chance, pick up that book. You'll find it interesting to read, Killers of the Flower Moon. Mark and I okay. had read that book. It was a few years ago we read it. I'm looking forward to the movie. Okay. Okay. Can you, tell, you, remind, you tell me what was that Indian tribe last week that you talked about? I'd never heard of it. It was around St. Louis and it completely disappeared. A big tribe. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm having a little hard time hearing you. Tony, she said um, last week, the tribe you talked about that was around St. Louis and disappeared. The Cahokians. Cahokians. C-A-H-O-K-I-A. N S. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Tony. I hope everybody has a good rest of your day. Okay. We'll see you next week. Bye.